Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out in God's house this morning. Um, I, I want to take a familiar story and start out with it this morning. Uh, the title of this message would be Know Your Enemy. How many of y'all, well first, um, I'll start out in Joshua chapter 5, start with verse 13, then I'm going over to Ephesians chapter 6. How many of y'all have a... Uh, an arch nemesis, so to speak. How many of you ever read any super, uh, super hero comic books? Long time ago. Long time ago. Okay. Every one of those superheroes had an arch nemesis, someone who was out to get them. And everywhere they would turn, they would be playing tricks on them or doing something to foul them up. Well, if you are a believer in Christ, you have an arch nemesis called the devil, Satan, Lucifer, and many other names he's known by. The question is, do you know how to recognize him and how to deal with him? How he operates? We'll start out in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verse 13. Like I said, it's a familiar story, but most of y'all know it, but I'm going to read it anyway. Chapter 5, verse 13, he says, And it came to pass, that when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Josh did so. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your scripture. But most of all, we thank you for you caring to send your Son to die on the cross for our sins. We just pray, dear Lord, that you would forgive us where we've sinned and that you would just pick us up and put us on a path that would be pleasing to you. We pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to put self to the side this morning, that we could take your word as you meant it to be applied to our life, dear Lord, and that you would just guide and direct this service in a way that would be pleasing to you and that everything that is seen and done here this morning would be for your praise and your glory and the benefit of your kingdom. We ask all these things in your holy name. Joshua had a problem. His problem was there was a fortified city in front of him. And God had promised it to him. Today, we have problems. Sometimes it's health problems. Sometimes it's obedience problems. Sometimes it's financial. But the problem is actually not the enemy. It's something that the enemy has thrown at us. I want you to notice here in the book of Joshua, when the Lord approached him, Joshua asked him, are you for us or for our adversaries? In other words, are you with me or against me? I want you to notice how the Lord approached Joshua here. He approached him as a man of war. God always approaches His people in a way that they can recognize Him. If you remember back in the Scripture, when God approached Abraham, He came as a weary traveler. When He approached Moses in the desert, it was through a burning bush. Today, we need to know how to recognize God when He approaches us to give us and guide us through our problems. <clears throat> Joshua realized that God was in control. He gave him the key to defeating Jericho. Even though the city was fortified, Joshua understood he had to obey the Lord. If you read on in verse 2, 
2, he said, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around the city once. Thus thou do six days. Joshua was given explicit and direct instructions on how to handle his problem. Now the directions he was given was to surround the city and march around it. The first thing we need to do with our problem, first thing we need to know is that our promise, that God has promised us, is locked behind a problem or a difficulty that we have to overcome. As Christians, we do not need to be looking at the problems, but looking at what God has promised us. And He will help us to get through the problems. Joshua was promised the city of Jericho, but if you looked at it, it was a fortified city with a wall. That's a problem. But God guided him and directed him through that problem. The second thing is we have to understand is it's not going to be easy to get through our problem to get to the promise. That we're going to have to fight for it. It's going to be a struggle. And in order to win this struggle and come out victorious, we have to understand who the enemy is. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, Apostle Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to understand that the enemy is not our financial problem. It's not the people that we see around us that are living in sin. It's not us having a bad day and things not going the way we planned. That's not who the enemy is. The enemy is Satan. God has already defeated him. But the problem is, we as Christians need to put our trust in God. If you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 19, he said, Dearly beloved, invent not yourselves, but rather give place to unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. <coughs> Today, when we come across people who are mistreating us, who we see as the problem, they're not a problem, they're a symptom of the problem. They are part of a sinful world that the devil is guiding and directing against us. You and I, as smart as we think we are, we haven't been around long enough to know how to defeat the devil when he comes at us in his various ways. Not by ourselves. That's why we need to put on the armor of God and stay in God's Word so that we will recognize the devil and have our faith and confidence in God when the devil approaches us with the snares that he has out for us. One of the things we need to understand is how the devil operates. You say, well, you're talking about him like he's very real. He is very real. Right. And his goal, if he cannot keep you from accepting Christ as your Savior, his goal is to destroy your testimony. One of the things that the devil loves in a Christian, or one who professes to be a Christian, is someone who goes along with whatever the world has to offer and says, well, it's okay. The devil loves that because it destroys our testimony. The devil operates, if you look here in verses 12, he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness. How many of y'all have ever watched wrestling on TV? Okay, how many, have ever, how many of you will admit to watching wrestling on TV? It's very entertaining. They do a lot of posturing. And that whole oh, my mom. Wrestling on TV that we know today is not what Apostle Paul was talking about. Let me tell you about how they wrestled in the Roman times. You would have two individuals and they would get in an arena. 
And when they wrestled, the one that was defeated, sometimes they would have their eyes gouged out. Sometimes they were put to death. Now, knowing that if you lost getting in that arena to wrestle, could possibly be death or your eyes punched out, how would you approach that wrestling match? You would be very serious about it, wouldn't you? If you couldn't get out of it, you would be very, very serious about getting ready for that, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Apostle Paul said we're wrestling against principality, spirit. In other words, Satan. The outcome of this wrestling match is a very serious and very deadly outcome. So what do you mean? If we give over to Satan and do not live for Christ, it's going to be very detrimental to our eternal life. It is important that we stay focused on what God's Word tells us. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. But I am come that they may have eternal, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In other words, the devil is here to destroy whatever we have in Christ. That's his goal. He cannot take away your salvation. But if he can make you a miserable person, then that is what excites him. That's got him going. But the only way he can do that is if we allow it. Because Christ has already won the battle. We've got to understand that in order for us to defeat Satan, we have to trust in God. Satan has been around for thousands of years. He has been tricking people and putting them to his service. What makes us think that we're so smart in the 40 or 50 years that we can outsmart the devil? We need to depend on God instead of trying to do it by ourselves. If we do not put on the whole armor of God that Apostle Paul was talking about here, the devil will get into the church, into the body of Christ, and he will cause confusion and difficulty because we're not grounded in God's Word. There is a lot of things going on today. You see a lot of Christians that are divorcing their wives. Well, it's not you. I still love you. I'll send you money, but I've got to go. Or you see wives leaving their husbands for someone else. You see families sending their kids to school and all of a sudden they're having panic attacks because they think their kids are getting beat up or shot or something in school. Because we see that on the news all the time. We see Christians who are putting confidence in everything but God. A lot of times now, even in the church, when you see people that are going through a problem, the first response is, well, they need counseling. <coughs> well, they've got a problem. They need counseling. We think we're so smart. The first thing they need is in James 4, 7. It says, Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Even a generation ago, when people started having problems, the first thing they would do is they would take it to the altars and take it to God and seek a solution from God. Now, they want to go everywhere else but God. And then as a last resort, turn to God. And don't get me wrong. I think doctors do a wonderful job. I think there's some good services out there to help people. But first and foremost, we need to seek the kingdom of God. I, believe, I firmly believe that's one of the problems that we have in this country is that everybody is putting things before God. You say, well, how can you say that? This is a wonderful country. It is. But this country is getting away from being grounded in God's Word. Amen. 
In order for us to solve our problems, first, we have to take God's Word and apply it to our lives. Not just saying, well, you know, Steve, what you say is good, but they took prayer out of schools. We can't mention God in public places anymore, hardly. That's true. But I firmly believe that before we allowed our public, public officials to take prayer out of schools, the majority of us took prayer out of our homes. If we don't have prayer, if we don't have God's Word being taught and lived in our individual homes, then it is not going to matter whether it is taught and practiced in public. If we don't do it in our private lives as an individual, then what we do as a nation is not going to, to pan out. That's where living for God starts, is in an individual's life. When we have problems, the first thing we need to do is take it to the Lord. Once we take it to the Lord, then we need to follow through. I read y'all the story of Joshua and what he was instructed to do in the battle of Jericho. What if Joshua had, when he walked, had the, the troops march around the city of Jericho, it was one time a day for six days. Say the third day, Joshua was standing there. He's like, you know, I know God came to me and told me to do this. That's what His Word says. But you know, this is ridiculous. Us playing trumpets and marching around the city, that's not going to do anything. You know what? We're going to take a shortcut. We're not going to do it the next three days. <clears throat> because it's pointless. The end result would have been Jericho would not have failed. Today as Christians, we get discouraged. We say, well, you know, I can't read my Bible every day. I, I, I can't live for the Lord every day. If I go this day and do what I want to, then I'll come back and everything will be okay. No. That's when we start missing out on God's promises. God expects His children to be faithful on a continual basis. Apostle Paul says pray without ceasing. In other words, we're continually in the service of God. If you go work for a company, say you go work for the city of Prattville down here. That's great. You working for them, okay? Then you take a week's vacation. Well, on your week's vacation, you're going to go work for this other company that's undermining or in competition with the city of Prattville. Well, after your week's vacation, you come back and you've been doing all these things in competition with them. What do you think your response is going to be when you get back there? Let's just say lukewarm at best. But yet we do that in our spiritual life all the time. Oh, I'm a Christian. I live for God. I, I, I believe God's Word. But you know what? This is Monday. Monday is Steve's day to go over here. Well, what you doing over here? Well, it don't exactly line up with God's Word, but it'll okay, be okay. It's only one day. No, it's not okay. Or, you know, I kind of work. I heard this really juicy joke, but it's a little bit dirty, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it anyway because it's funny. It'll be okay. No, it won't. Because I am representing Christ in my life, and then I'm doing something that stands directly against everything that He stands for. That is not okay. Ooh, it's getting awful quiet now. We as Christians need to be very mindful of what we profess and how we follow through on it. One of the, two of the biggest weapons that Satan has that he uses is exhaustion and discouragement. So, how can you say that? You see people in churches all the time. They will get on fire for the Lord. They will be part of this program. They'll be part of that. They'll be part of the Sunday school. They'll be part of whatever. And they're on fire for the Lord. And then in a few weeks, they are wore out. 
And the first thing they say, well, you know, I'm not going to quit church. I'm not going to quit serving God. But I'm going to take a break for a couple of weeks. Then all of a sudden, they're out of church. They're doing things that are directly contrary to God's Word. And their relationship with Christ is so strained that they don't even recognize His Word anymore. The other thing is discouragement. Each and every one of us goes through life and we have things that are dealt to us that we do not like. It depends on how we handle it. It's real easy when you're going out there and giving all for something and things start going wrong. It's like, I give up. I'm through. Do not quit. You cannot stop the race in the middle of the race. You cannot stop serving God in the middle because you're going to miss out on a lot of blessings and promises that God has for you if you quit in the middle of the race. One of the things that a lot of employers complain about in today's society is that they do not have employees that are dedicated and that are not willing to work for any length of time for that company. The typical person in the workforce today, they say, changes jobs 12 to 15 times during the course of their employment history. Now, that's not the people that's working temporary jobs. That's the people that stay employed long term. If you and I are so fickle in our lives that we cannot stay focused on what's important, we're going to miss out on God's blessings. The average Christian, if you look at them, do they serve God? Look at ourselves. Are we faithful to what we say we are in serving God? Do we do what we commit ourselves to doing for God's service? Or are we one of those individuals who says, you know, I, I would love to serve God, I would love to do this, but I just don't feel like it today. I, I got a little sniffle today, so I don't think I'm going to be able to come to Sunday school class. I know I got a Sunday school class to teach, but you know, I got a little sniffle, I'm not going to make it today. We need to understand the devil will use our physical weariness and exhaustion and our discouragement to damage our relationship with Christ. He won't take our salvation away because He can't. He can't touch that. Because if He could, He would. But He can't touch that. But what He can do is He can make us so unpleasant to be around that we cannot reach anybody else. Now I'm going to talk about someone that I know very close. Better than I know anybody else for just a second. You know, it's not my wife. This individual, so bored is when he gets up, he is so grouchy that nobody can't stand to be around him. In fact, his wife has threatened him put him in a corner by himself until he could get his attitude right. <laughs> Why? Because he's grouchy. He's discouraged. Exhausted. Well, if you're that tired and exhausted, Steve, why don't you stay in bed? Why, why do you keep doing things like God's Word tells us to carry on. Don't quit. Now, 
He also tells us that He came to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. Now, if I'm being grouchy all the time, I'm not living an abundant, an abundant life, am I? Absolutely not. Problem is that every once in a while, sometimes more every once in a while, we let the devil get to us. We start thinking about how bad we have it compared to somebody else. Well, i got news for you. God has blessed me with a lot of blessings. So why am I comparing myself to somebody else? God is blessing and dealing with them according to His Word as well. But I need to be thankful for what God has blessed me with instead of grouching about. I need to be thankful for the blessings that I have instead of, well, I don't have that 50 inch flat screen TV with HD surround sound that I want. We can always find things that we want from a materialistic point of view to complain about. But if you have salvation, if you have Christ, then you really have nothing to complain about. Ephesians 6.13, he said, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand. I want you to notice something there in verse 13. He said, being able to stand in the evil day. In other words, that tells me that Satan is not going to be able to keep throwing things at us. There's a limit to how much God's going to allow Satan to throw at us. He said that you might be able to stand in the evil day. In other words, for a season, Satan is going to work on us. But after that, he's going to be cut off. The problem is, if we're not careful, we will get discouraged and quit before Satan is done. If you look at Matthew, when Jesus was in the wilderness, he had been in the wilderness fasting for 30 days and nights. The devil came to him and tempted him three times. And each time Jesus responded with what? The Word of God. And after the third time, the Scripture says in Matthew 4.11, He says, And then the devil leaveth him. If we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil with the Word, the devil will eventually leave us alone because he cannot stomach God's Word. Now the key to that entire verse it's the first two words. Something that none of us like to do. Submit to God. If we're not in God's will and submitting to God, we can resist the devil all we want to and we're not going to come out on top. In Galatians 6 9, he said, Don't quit, stay focused. Notice he said, and in 6 9, he said, And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In other words, what Apostle Paul is saying is, Don't give up. You're not going to win the wrestling match if you quit. You're not going to be successful on your job if you quit. You're not going to be successful in your relationship with others if you quit. You're not going to have a good family life if you give up on it. You're not going to have a good church life if you quit, if you give up. You're not going to grow spiritually if you quit trying to serve God and start going through the motions. You and I are not going to be successful 
and grow as Christians if we quit. I know this morning this message was, was directed at people who are saved, but this is something that we all need from time to time. We cannot give up on God. God has never given up on His people. Is his people have given up on Him from time to time. But it is important for our eternal security, for our rewards in heaven, that we do not give up on Christ. It's important that we reach our loved ones and continue to pray for them and to tell them about Christ so that they can have eternal life as well. It's important for our testimony, for God's kingdom, that we stay faithful to what we promised God. As we close here, I want you each and every one to ask yourself this one question. Have I given up? Or, am I still encouraged Am I still working for God's kingdom? As Miss Tina comes and Miss May. As Christians, coming to church is great. That's important. It's part of God's work. But why are we coming to church? Is it because we know we're supposed to be here? Or is it to learn more about God and to get closer to Him because we're still struggling in the wrestling match? Or have we already given up and just going through the motions? There's so many times today that in a lot of areas of our life we give up and just go through the motions. Whatever you and I do today, we need to be sincere and committed to serving Christ.